Happy Monday. Happy Monday or <laughs> Monday morning, Monday evening, depending on where you're located. Yeah. <laughs> so for Matt and I, it's Monday morning. Uh, I think for Andreas, it's, um, what time is it over there right now? Uh, 5 p.m. is here. Okay. In Germany. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, welcome. The Monday morning data nice. chat. So yeah, um, normally Matt and I kind of pick a topic and go, but um, I think we'll kind of ad lib at this time. I think we have a kind of a general topic we're going to talk about, which is um, you know mentorship and training and uh, data engineering. So um, I don't know when you want to kick it off and get some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about this topic yesterday because uh, data engineering is a little bit weird, right? Uh, people go to school and they tend to study things like data science or software engineering. Uh, most people, when they start college, aren't thinking about a data engineering career. And so I think we find a lot of people are migrating into the career from starting somewhere else. Uh, the other general problem is that there's kind of a shortage of data engineers. And so I think there's just always this need to train more people. And so if you're on a data engineering team, mentorship is a key part of the role. And there's just a need in the wider world to be mentoring people to really build out the profession. That, those were my general thoughts. And I, I think that will kick off all kinds of discussion today. Yeah, uh, I think I think as well. Like the mentoring is very important, especially if you're in in smaller companies or in smaller teams where there are not no no big no there's not big staff like ten ten engineers or something. It's super super important. How does that work though in a small team with mentorship? Like, what, have you seen some ways that work better than others? It depends. Well, if you if you really have have a senior uh, person, then that usually works very good. If the senior person also wants to do that, uh, if you don't have a senior in in that team, most likely you need to get some external help. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we tend yeah. to find the same things over here in the states too. I think uh, data engineering is one of those things where um, I think people are companies are starting to want to do it, um, but it's hard to find. It's hard to know even where to get started, frankly, sometimes, especially if, you're, if you have not had data engineering um, on your team before. Um, like, and so it's kind of this crux where maybe you have a software engineer who wants to learn data or maybe a data scientist or an analyst who wants to learn data engineering. And so that becomes a bit of a challenge. <clears throat> so. That's true. That's... Yeah, completely agree. I mean, a lot of the stuff we do is we, we find these really talented teams who don't have specific data engineering experience. They're like, all right, I'm a data scientist, I want to build these pipelines. Like, where do I even get started? And these teams learn things really fast, but you sort of got to point them in the right direction and say, okay, first let's make some technology choices. Like, what are you actually trying to do here? What are your priorities, ease of use? You know, do you want to be using SQL or do you want to be using something like Spark? Um, what's the data scale? All those fundamental decisions and then, then point them in the direction of certifications and, and all kinds of additional training. Yeah, that's true because very often, um, in my coaching uh, sessions, I also have not just students who want to become data engineers, so but also like um, professional, for instance, scientists, and they have problems and they they don't know how to solve it. And a lot of times, a lot of times is like, okay, uh, figure out where where's your problem, like what what is what is actually your problem. And, and right now, I have a student who's, who's working for for a government, and they. Like they manage a lot of machines, a lot of computers, and they like he, he built something, but he wasn't wasn't satisfied with it. But actually, had no solution of okay, how like how what should I do? Like, what's the problem? And now here are a few technologies where you could actually resolve this issue, but not like take this, but more in the case of there are these ways. Let's let's figure out what what's a good what's a good solution for that? And it's, it's, it's interesting. Andres, have you done any mentoring of like data managers who might not be hyper, hyper technical, but like have a pretty good grasp of the field and are like, okay, I, I have this great team. Like, how can I go forward? How can I build this infrastructure and, and serve these particular business needs? Um, usually I don't, I don't uh, mentor men, uh, like, management uh, i have right now i have uh, one in the coaching uh, who is uh, who actually wants to move with his team from from on premise to uh, to the cloud where i give a few tips um 
but for, for general for like a data strategy or how to how to build teams and so on that's uh, that's usually not what i do would be mm. very interesting though yeah, it seems like um, yeah. you'd be good at it i'm just thinking about it and we we run into this especially with cloud migrations right like you it, it's hard to do a cloud migration with purely technical people because it's a huge risky undertaking and you have to have someone who has some clout in the company and so yeah we, we obviously try to find those people and work with the team and the manager to say, here's how we're going to pitch this to the company is a good idea. Yeah, it, it's a good point because it's, well, there are usually, it's not like a black and white decision. Do we want to go to the cloud? What do we want to run in the cloud, especially for, for, for large companies? Mm -hmm. Like, um, the, it's not just, oh, let's go there and let's, uh, let's save a lot of money there. Like, <laughs> Like could also blow stay. a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you need some. You need the management needs to understand that, and you need to pitch that in the right way. Yeah. 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 Well, and also it's always a tug of war, honestly. Like which cloud you even choose. So, so often you have some like Microsoft stuff running. So you go to Azure, and then they might be a retailer. So like, well, we kind of like AWS, but we don't really like Amazon.com because we're a retailer. And then uh, they might like, you know, they might have a lot of advertising. So do we go to Google Cloud because we use a lot of Google Ads? And even there, people need guidance and mentorship to try to weigh all those considerations. And then again, to try to pitch it to whoever the stakeholders are above them. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, Scott Taylor, what's up, Scott? <laughs> he's got a question here. Uh, yeah, so he's, he's a great guy. Um, so where does data ops fit into all this? Um, I think I'll take a stab at this. It's something I've actually been writing about. I, I, we see data ops as being sort of an undercurrent of one of the undercurrents of data engineering that kind of goes along the entire life cycle. So it's one of those things where um, it, it would be hard to ignore it, I think, at any stage of the uh, data engineering life cycle or pipeline, whatever you want to call it. So what does that mean, though, right? So you're talking automation <clears throat> um, of deployments. Um, you know, you're talking about observability and monitoring. And then you're talking about um, you know, being able to respond to, to incidents, right? So these are all the things, it's basically DevOps, but applied to data, but data is a different beast. It's not an application, application DevOps, for example, is I, I think um, it's a bit more straightforward because uh, you don't have the messy component of uh, data in the mix so much and data reliability and quality. So, um, but I think, you know, to Scott's point too, Scott's, Scott hits really hard on <clears throat> sort of master data, right? And data quality and, and you know, the golden records and everything being in place. Without good data, kind of everything else falls by the wayside. And I think um, data ops definitely helps. Uh, I think it'll, going forward, especially with more technologies, it'll provide more observability into um, data management questions. But I think data management's a, almost a separate undercurrent from data ops. But what's everyone else's opinion on this? I think it's, for, for me, it's kind of still gelling, so. Well, for... <laughs> I thought Matt, Matt was Matt. All at once, guys. I was going to give you this one. I've been talking a lot, <laughs> so go for it. I'll, I'll go next. <laughs> I, I think I think you, you you touched on on a few good good topics that I also see. Um, actually, observe what's happening right now. Right? Is everything working? Where do I have some some problems? Um, how do I monitor all this? And how how do I actually fix the problems? Very. Or, or find out which were the problems. That's something that fits, that also fits with the data. So not just like the software that you write, but also like, is, is, is there something like, did, did something change on the API that we, where we get the data and like, should we, should we do something? How do we figure out if something goes wrong or something changed? That's some. That's when you when you have something in production. That's where the problems usually arise because stitching something together for a quick, quick proof of concept or uh, that works usually. But then you have ops problem. Yeah, for sure. What are your thoughts, Matt? Well, I guess the other comment I'd make is that especially in a cloud environment, um, data engineers tend to both write the code and do the ops. Um, I think in the software development world, it's kind of a mix. Like you have cross-functional teams where every software engineer is going to carry a pager, and then you have companies where those roles are very, very separate. And I don't know that I've seen that so much in the data engineering world where, where data ops is completely separate from data engineering. And so, yeah, it's something that like data engineers have to learn how to be operational people, how to monitor, 
how to you know how to, how to think about SLAs, how how to decide what data has to be available twenty four hours a day and what data could go out once in a while if there is a major problem. I think it really depends on the size of the company, though. Too. Yeah, that's true. That's so, fair. Yeah. You know. We, we, data maturity comes a lot into play with this too. What's that? But yeah. what, what do you mean by so by the size of the company? So what, would, would would it be better in bigger or or worse? In I, I would say actually I want to rephrase that as saying I think it, it depends on the data maturity of a company. Right? Okay. And I think size is sort of irrespective. We've seen big companies that are very amateurish at data, and we've seen small companies that are very proficient at it. And so I think it more depends on that. And size is probably a bit of a a, a misnomer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say at a certain point, maybe, you know, there's separate data ops teams. It, it really depends on the use case though, too. You know, if you're setting up a kind of a standard, like modern data stack, for example, like a lot of the observability data ops is handled by all the components that you're you've paid for, like Fivetran, for example, right? So they're handling all that behind the scenes for you. Um, in, uh, uh, Rosanna Elridge, she uh, says data management seems more involving metadata and ownership. Yeah, I think traditionally that's been the case. I, I increasingly think though that data management and data ops are gonna be blurred. Um, for precisely the reason that, that data ops does provide the, the ability to observe um, and monitor things, whereas in the past it wasn't as clear cut as that. Um, she also thinks that data ops is like data versioning, drift, maybe feature stores. Yeah, I don't know. What, what do people think about the, this uh, sort of delineation? Yeah. yeah, it's a tricky problem, right? I mean, I was thinking just now, like, what is the best practice for data ops? Should it be separate or should it be together? I think in the software world, you have advocates on both sides, some people who say that, okay, DevOps says that we should work hand in hand, but you're going to have a separate ops team. And then you have the advocates for cross-functional teams who are like, no, no, every software developer should carry a pager and have some operational responsibility. It gives them more empathy, it helps them to write better code by having to do that once in a while. And yeah, I've, I've seen big companies go either way. And so it's it's an interesting question in terms of uh, data mm -hmm. maturity. One problem I always see is like separating these two functions. Mm -hmm. Like yep. it's, it's not as simple as, as, as developing an app and then have right. an ops team who goes in and <laughs> like, simple, you know, in, in quotes, but like, and, and then that, that team goes in and fixes problems or changes something. Like when you think about engineering, it's it, there are multiple steps in pipelines and there are multiple tools involved, and it's not it, it's not so simple to actually have a, a separate ops team that 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 understands what is actually going on. And if I change something here, how does that actually affect the, the rest down down the line? You know that that's it's a bit tricky. It's yeah. Um. Got a question here. Uh, blah, 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 da, 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 da. Since the data engineering stack <laughs> is, uh, got a lot of questions actually queued up here. So everybody who's asked questions, please be patient for a second. So uh, Alberto, what's up? Um, uh, data engineering uh, stack tech ecosystem evolves every year. How long does it take to be a decent one in the field? Um, you guys want to tackle this one? I, I can jump in first this time. Um, I, I think, I mean, we, we talk a lot about this notion. And I, I think uh, one thing Joe and I talk about is rejecting the idea that there's a single stack that like defines data engineering. So for example, Spark is not equal to data engineering. Spark is an important data engineering tool, but it's one, one among many that you might encounter. Um, I, I think the really important thing, the foundation, is that uh, people develop these overall engineering intuitions and just general data practices. And so for example, if you can develop core skills of SQL and maybe Spark and a couple of other tools, plus general cloud skills, then you can learn new tools as they come along. But until you develop that foundation, you're gonna feel kind of at sea anytime you encounter a new tool. And so I would say, I mean, the longer you're in the discipline, the better, but it's never gonna completely settle down. It's a discipline where you constantly have to new, learn new things and evolve your skills. And that's just the reality you have to face. You, yeah, you need to, I agree with that, Matt. Like you, you need to stay at it. You need to learn new stuff, but also it's important. It, that touches a bit on what you said. Like there are these, these patterns that you see all the time. And once you, once you've seen it a bit and uh, then like how, when to actually use a message queue, when not, when to run an ETL job instead, when, like, when you, when you see, okay, this, this tool behaves like this, and then there's another one coming along and then you see, okay, that's more, more or less the same thing. You can't use it because you don't know the details, but it's like, 
when you have this experience then you're then you're a good engineer where you can immediately see okay there's there's a way how to how to actually solve this problem or, or, or here's here's a problem in this pipeline that right so hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's a bit of an interesting, um, I, I always get stuck on the on certain words, like decent one in the field. Like, so that, that could mean a lot of things, I think. Maybe there's certain base level knowledge that we all need, but I also think it's like, are you effectively solving the problems at your company? So, I mean, to, to me, that'd be an effective data engineer and a decent one at that, right? Where if you're able to figure out the problems and solve them in, I think, a cost-effective, efficient manner, then to me, you're, you're decent at your job, at your company. That's not to say you'll be effective at Netflix or Amazon, because that's a different problem, right? Or wherever, but I, I think that, um, so it's a, it's a nuanced one. I, I always go back, I mean, Andreas has some good courses, uh, go check them out, give you a good foundation. Um, Designing Data Intensive Applications from O'Reilly, I still think is one of the best books ever written on uh, um, just sort of the foundational stuff you need to know on, um, from a technical aspect as a data engineer. But there's there's so much more to know too, I would say, like how to communicate with the teams and, um, you know, how to, um, I guess how to be effective in like the non-technical aspects as well. You know, the, the best data engineers I've seen, the ones who move up in the ranks, either to a principal level or, um, you know, or, or end up going into management are the ones who I think are, are really good at um, getting requirements, identifying those, being able to communicate um, with stakeholders and and so forth. Basically things you need to be effective at like any job, <laughs> engineering or not, frankly. So, um, but, but yeah. these one that what you've said was is a really really good point like use only what you really need because mm -hmm. let's stay let's stay honest like a lot of us we see some new shiny tool and we need to solve a problem oh, should we do <laughs> <laughs> like should we get that should we get oh, use that? all of them <laughs> right yeah, almost everybody does that but y as a decent decent engineer you need to actually hold yourself back and and like do i really need that does that sort of solve the, the purpose is that overkill and you need to have that knowledge to actually understand that and that yeah is, is sure. a great, great well and often i mean you'll find so so for example if i'm using kafka already say i need to have kafka in my pipeline and I, I might have a problem where I could integrate Kafka with Spark Streaming, but maybe I could just use a simple solution like KSQL. Like if it's, it's easy, if it's an easy data engineering problem, well, like use the simplest tool that you can and just like, oh, I could pull out KSQL and do some basic data filtering and maybe that solves my problem. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, try to avoid the Rube Goldberg. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, no, no, go on. Yeah, Rube Goldberg. Avoid easy. the Rube Goldberg machine. If you or, or embrace it in, in, in open arms <laughs> either way. Um, I just, mean, it is just Lambda, right? It is like Rib Goldberg. You know, ball, it is. Ball, ball, I've seen ball, some crazy Lambda. stuff in Lambda before. It's 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 nuts. I mean, it's a great tool, yeah. but um, you can uh, you can have a lot of fun with that one. Uh, Mark asked a question here. Morning, gents. Um, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are, or evening. Um, we get a lot of international listeners too. Uh, um, can you comment on the future role of data engineering components in data science education? I feel as if my life would be much better if I was a better data engineer. Um, He's a senior data scientist at NVIDIA uh, for some context. So uh, all at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, one comment I have here, um, Google has their, has a data engineering certification basically. And I really like it. I think it points, that, I mean, it is Google Cloud specific, but I think it sets a good direction for the field in general. And one thing they tell you in their materials for that certification is that you should know enough machine learning so that you can have a conversation, an intelligent conversation with machine learning engineer, and you can work together to solve a problem. So that doesn't mean that you need to know absolutely everything about futurization, but you should understand the concept of futurization and the problems that a machine learning engineer might be struggling with and how you as a data engineer can assist them in solving those problems. And so I think it's a similar thing here where Maybe there needs to be a notion of baseline data engineering education for data scientists so that they can effectively communicate their problems and say, hey, data engineer, maybe this is something you can help me to solve and we can work together on this problem. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. What would you teach? Me? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah Andreas, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> or either one. <laughs> well, it, it depends. And so for the for the data scientists, I think the 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 problem with the data scientists is it's usually the education is too much focused around the actual data science and the the building proof of concept and the, like it, it has too much it, it doesn't show too much around that like how does the platform work what parts are of a platform do you usually have how can you actually 
um, like use the individual tools uh, in in these areas. I, I usually separate this into, okay, you have somewhere like an ingestion or a connect phase where you get the data in, then you have maybe a, a buffer or a message queue in between, then a processing framework, a store and a visualization. And there are these tools all in these categories. And I think for it, for a data scientist, data scientist should, should start to learn actually what is in there? What are some examples that, how can you build, build something out of this? So mm -hmm. that the data scientist, once, once the proof of concept is done, once the, the analytics is finished, you know, it's not really finished ever, but once the, once, once the the first breakthrough is done. How do we automate this and how can we set something up and don't, don't go big, but like, what are, what are tools you can use that makes sense. And I think that's a lot what what is missing right now. That's good points. What do you think about uh, the other thing I'd add is that, um, I, I'd like to see an evolution of data science toward focusing more on data as a product. And by that, I mean that there's an exploratory phase always of data science or, or data engineering for that matter, where it's like, okay, I've never seen this data before. We just got this. I'm going to start exploring on my laptop. But there's kind of this intermediate phase before when you say, oh, this data is valuable and lots of people in my company might want to start consuming it before you develop a full data science product. And often what happens is people just continue working on their laptops when it might be time to say, hey, data engineering, maybe we should start productizing this data and communicating and saying, here are things I see in this data, here are quality issues, here are things we can work together on in terms of automating and making this available more widely. And then it's a virtuous cycle where as that happens, it, the job of the data scientist becomes much easier, becomes much easier for them to continue the exploration process if that data is delivered automatically instead of them continuing to manually pull from an API clean the data and those kinds of things that frankly are very yeah. traditional in data science. And that really should be the job of the data engineer too, though, yeah. is to make the, the data scientist's life like as easy as possible. Yeah. I mean, it's the old, the old trope, right? Like data scientists spend 80, 90% of their time cleaning data, getting data, all this stuff. And I'm like, I think it's been like flip that. It should be the data engineer doing a lot of that work. Um, but the data, data scientist needs to know the questions to ask. Like, can I get this data more uh, quickly in better shape? Um, is there a way I can serve data, you know, uh, more easily and, and retrain and whatever else you're doing. And there's a multitude of things. Um, so I anyway, look like you want to say something, Andreas? Oh, no, it, 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 I, I usually, I, this, it, that's one of my things. I usually say, yes, yes, yes. Like, <laughs> agree, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should no, the microphone. <laughs> but like, I, I'm, I'm thinking usually, I'm thinking also the other way around that mm. unfortunately in companies, the engineering teams are usually quite small. They don't bring in direct revenue. They, they are like a burden very often. So most likely the scientist needs to start and do some, some engineering themselves, like mm -hmm. start something to actually, that's that, that's, that fits to what you said to productionalize even a, an idea. So you can show the management, how oh, look, look what I've built. And then, then you get the resources. So that that's, that's what I, where I'm coming from. I mean, Matt, that's kind of you and I's uh, path. I mean, I think we were both data scientists before, and then we became data engineers. Um, I think mainly as a reaction to the stuff that we kept seeing where yeah. you know, you're hired into these projects and then you can't do anything because you don't have the infrastructure. So it's like, well, I can sit around and wait for somebody to do it, or I guess we can just go build it and figure it out. And so, I mean, I noticed this back when I got into machine learning way back in the you know, late 2000s, early 2010s, and it was you didn't have any data engineering stuff. It wasn't even like a term back then. Mm -hmm. So it was, just, it was software engineering, right? It but applied to data. data. No, it was big data as well. There was big data. Um, yeah. And all these things I think, you know, sort of converged um, into what, what is now data engineering. But the, at the end of the day, it's still, you're not building these, um, you know, giant uh, palaces for yourself when you're building them for downstream consumption by data scientists and analysts and so forth. So. Yeah. I mean, you just jump in and do the job, right? And at some point you're like, okay, this needs to be productionized. So I'll adopt Airflow, I'll adopt some cloud services. And then pretty soon it's like, wait, I'm now the specialist in all this stuff. So do I want to continue as a data scientist and try to do both? Or do I just specialize more? Yeah, that was definitely my path. Yeah. Got a question what are here. You guys, what what are you guys thinking about like doing both? Because I, I get this asked a lot of times, like, are it, it, a data, there should be full stack data scientists who basically do everything, the engineering mm -hmm. and the science and like, 
you don't really need engineers. What, what's your take on this? Uh, I remember I was approached by one of the big fan companies to go work as a full, because they like my full stack data science approach, full stack data approach. And I actually thought I, I, I was, I had a weird um, reaction to that because I thought it was um, the same thing as like kind of a full stack developers that you would see back in the day, where it was like, you're great at Node, you're great at Angular. This was like a popular stack back in, you know, the back in the day. But I, I felt like, you know, if you're, if you're good at everything, you're great at nothing. And so I, I felt like you couldn't develop expertise. And I, I like being somebody who wants to kind of go deep into stuff. Uh, fortunately, I've been able to go deep in, I guess, a few areas right now, like machine learning and analytics and now data engineering. But it's like, um, I felt like if you would just have a dilution of skills if that's all you did all day, because you, you could never establish expertise. I don't think you would become an expert at being a generalist, I guess, if that makes any sense. Um, but that's all you get good at, and so. But it depends on your career goals, I suppose. Um, I mean, there are people, especially at early, um, early companies where, where you're kind of low in data maturity. I mean, the data scientist and data engineer are probably the same person. So, or if it's or it's a software engineer who's building the app and trying to take a stab at data engineering and, and data science, if that's uh, you know what their app is supposed to do. It's weird these days, though, right? Because you got stuff like Firebase, which makes it like it's like ridiculously, almost absurdly easy to start doing build an application, put your data into BigQuery, and then also get uh, recommendations and machine learning like baked into the app. So that's I, that's an interesting progression um, on a question that we're gonna come up in a second in the future of data engineering, but that's my thoughts on it, I don't know, so. Um, got a question here from Ashen. Um, Hi all, great way to start a Monday, completely agree. Um, what's your take on Scrum Agile for data engineering teams, pros, cons, techniques that have worked well for your teams? Go for it. Yeah, I mean, well, no, maybe I'll give this one to Andreas. So you want to <laughs> well, um, I per I personally am I'm not a big fan of um, of Scrum for especially for smaller teams. Um, I don't think it makes too much sense, uh, but actually, in general, it makes a lot of sense for also for for uh, data engineering. Like you need to have some some goal setting somewhere. And um, usually how, how I worked a lot of times is like uh, doing a Monday round where on Monday we went through the, the past week and what, what, uh, what was good, what was bad, what do we need to change? Is there something coming up? And then doing, and then during the week, getting st still staying in touch, but like more in an informal way, like doing like we, you, for instance, you can use a tool like like DevOps, Azure DevOps, or something for that. You could also go for for uh, for how's it called on Microsoft, like in Teams, set just simple like a mm. Kanban board. Yep. Like for Scrum, I'm always a bit. Oh, this is like... <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. He... You can tell he's a big fan of Scrum. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just like, uh, can we talk about like uh, something else? Um, yeah. Anything? <laughs> so, um, well, one know. thing Joe and I have been discussing a lot is sort of this tension between traditional enterprise architecture and modern, more agile practices. And there's even a question like, well, if you're doing cloud data engineering, do you need architects? Do you need architecture? And I, I think the answer we came to was yes. And your architects help work with the data engineers to kind of make the big decisions, right? So they collaborate and say, okay, which cloud are we going to go to? What are our common components? In other words, where does get data get stored? What are our common query engines? Um, and then data engineers kind of work off of those pieces and develop specialized, you know, technologies to connect into the main components. But but essentially, I think the modern approach is that when you're when you start when you have an architecture decision and so you decide to do a cloud migration, you do break that into smaller pieces, whether you call that Scrum or Agile or whatever. Um, I agree that I, I think there, it, it's fair to say that maybe there's some controversy around some of these practices and there's a, there's a lot of ceremony too. There's a lot of ceremony. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it kind of drives me nuts about it. But then it depends on your project manager and the mood he or she is in as well. So. Yeah. Um, cause I think there's, you know, project managers, I mean, the ones I've worked with a lot of the good ones, I think are, are fans of, um, uh, asking questions and being really iterative. I think the ones that I, I see like where agile and scrum kind of go off the rails is when it becomes more of a dogma, um, versus doing what's appropriate for the project at hand. 
you know, when, when it's like making a ton of sticky notes and sticking them on the wall, just, just because that's how the wall should be decorated at that day. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's absurd. I, I have a chuckle, but that's, you know, some, that's, that's how some people make their money. Right. So it's, it's, it's always like, you know, show me the incentive. I'll show you the outcome. And so always how I look at it. Like if you are, if you're incentivized to do agile and, and, you know, pray at the altar of the, you know, the agilistas and go for it. Um, it's, it's, you know, Matt, it's kind of ironic, actually, the agile manifesto. Do you realize it's at the 20th anniversary of it? And it was actually written in Salt Lake city, yeah. just a few miles from here up on a hill. Yeah. And so, Snowbird was it or Alta? Yeah. Snowbird. Yeah. 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 So, um, got a bit of a local connection. I guess we should go up there and, uh, um, pay homage to the uh, Agile Manifesto. Go set off some fireworks or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't That's do that. You'd um, ever do something so irresponsible right now. Um, yeah. it's, so it's, it's funny too. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. No, no, go on. I, I was just going to say, I mean, one, one thing, one bit of ceremony that really irritated the hell out of me in the past is that you'd, you have this like abstraction of story points, right? I, I think that's a valuable abstraction to like do estimations and say, this is how many story points this is. But then at some point you'd have a bad week where things just went south. And then you'd have managers saying, oh, well, why are why is our velocity so low? And all they meant was like how many story points you're producing. And it's like, well, now you're putting the abstraction in front of the actual work that's getting done. I can go through every one of these items and tell you why we had problems and why we overpromised on them. Isn't that more important than the story points, even though we call the story points the KPI? I don't know. There's a bit of a subtle point to that, which is it talking is. about the data engineering team. So, I mean, is there anything yeah. different about Agile or Scrum as it applies to data engineering versus any other discipline? Yeah, that's a good question. I think so. What I what I seen within within engineering is that the actual the coding very often isn't the actual hard part. The hard part mm -hmm. is actually the yeah you know, the the figuring out what to do, yeah, how to do it. That's that's very often the the problem. Like when I when I worked as a as a SAP developer, it was fairly simple. You get a you get a, a, a How's he called in English? Like a, a, a specification. You get a mm. specification. There is there are the points done that are in there that should be done. Then you code it down, and that's that's it. Like it's fairly simple. But if you if you get to engineering, like then it gets to the point. Okay, how how does the data actually look? Where do we want to go? How, mm. What how do we transform it in between? What do we need to like? do for, as we said before, monitoring and exception handling and validation of the data and like, it's, it's a bit different than, mm -hmm. than, than coding parts of, a, of an app or. Yeah, I can see that. It comes out also that kind of the notion of data testing, kind of what we're talking about earlier with data ops and so forth and data management, right? Um, you can see, so seeing a lot more of that. Um, there's a few frameworks I like DBC and um, a couple others, but I think that's where you're going to start seeing more attention and data quality tests as well. Um, you know, I was at a, uh, a get together the other night with um, the team from Great Expectations who had their, um, you know, the data quality library. So, starting to see more of that stuff. And I think that's going to become more, kind of more of a um, kind of the expectation when you're talking about sprints, especially like, did you write your data test? Did you write your data quality test? It's not just, did you like write your pipeline <laughs> with, with a bunch of shitty data in it? Sorry, uh, it's leaked in. Um, so, yeah, so we'll see. Um, Keaton has a question for us. Um, so he's in data engineering now. Congratulations on that, by the way. It's awesome. He was in the uh, coaching program. No way. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> so for everybody who uh, <laughs> check out Andreas' uh, coaching program, uh, you'll get into data engineering. That's awesome, dude. Cool. Okay. Um, Hi, Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he has uh, no computer science background, and now I feel that I lack um, knowledge of data structures. Uh, your advice to overcome this gap for your skills. You want to take that, Andreas? Data structures is you have this all the time. I think we we talked about all the uh, also in this in the coaching. Um, it's like it's very it's a very important part, but it, the structures depend very often on the actual tools that you work with, where you want to go. Um, I see this more in like the way when you're working with a with a key value store, when you work with a white column store, when you work with a, a um, document-based database. It's the, the structures then, you need different structures and uh, you, it's a practice thing. It's a, it's a practice thing, actually. But I remember, I, I can, uh, I'm a bit, a bit confused. I had the feeling like you were really good in this stuff, like what, what you've done. <laughs> cool. 
Algorithms is an interesting one, though. I, I think, yeah. and, and data structures, right? I kind of like, they lump the two together in computer science. Um, I, I, th I suppose it depends on what you what you need. Um, are you doing this for an interview, or are you doing this for like personal growth? Um, so, yeah, data structures are something you probably should know, but I, I think it doesn't come up on the job regularly. It's not like anyone's going to ask you what's, you know, it described to me how merge sort works versus quick sort, for example, right? Um, I mean, that never happens. Um, maybe, but maybe I'll you make should know so or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you should know stuff like how like binary search works. I think that's just like a really good thing to know anyway, like because that's that indicates like how you would understand how indexes work in a database, for example, right? So, as you work as a data engineer, just understanding like some of the top level concepts of that. But I would approach it more for just from a, probably a personal education standpoint, if anything, too. Where if you're um, interested in algorithms uh, and data structures, um, I mean, there's no shortage of materials online to, to figure these things out. As, as you point out, Andreas Hacker Rank, I mean, a lot of these are interview questions. Um, uh, Matt may have a different uh, approach. I think he comes from an academic background and might have a, a slightly different flavor. So, No, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you here, Joe. I mean, I've, I've taught a lot of people Python. Actually, we both have over the years because it just comes up so organically. Uh, one of the common things I see is that people at first have trouble. They know what a dictionary is and they know what a list is, but they don't understand the performance differences. Like if I want to search for something, why would I use a, a set or a dictionary rather than using a list? Mm -hmm. And so it, reading is awesome. And I, I think I'll, I'll turn them to a book like Fluent Python. Fluent Python is awesome for this because it actually gets into the details of how hashing algorithms work, how dictionaries work, how key value lookups work. And then that will actually lead you into understanding a lot of database technologies too, like the but, difference between indexing and scanning and these kinds of different approaches that are, are critical. And in that's that a, this question brings I, up I, a good point. Yeah, go for I, it. I, mis I misread this question a bit. But okay. like, I think it goes the same. It goes back to the point I was making. You need to actually like, you need to just try this out. You need to just work on it. It's yeah. like, the, it, that's the, the experience that you need to build on this. So you don't need to fear it or like, it's just exercise in this yeah to really get good in this in this kind of like, that's so true muscle memory is key you just got to do it a lot and, but but if not and it's not the most as you said before it's not that you need to have know everything and right how often have we googled the dumbest thing ever like the simplest stuff because like you not just the simplest stuff, stuff but the stuff that you knew and studied before and somehow forgot yeah I mean, for God's sake, Matt has a PhD in math, and how much stuff do you actually remember from from that experience? <laughs> I don't use it that much these days, day to day, right. the stuff I did. Yeah, it's true. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll ask you this, Andreas, too. Like, um, we're not good at German, so how did you get good at English? You know, what was your experience learning English? Well, you like just keep using it, and you forget stuff all the time. I assume I, I don't know your full background yeah. with English, yeah. but like you just keep doing it, basically. It's yeah. You need to you need to use it all day, and, and yeah. like for for me, it was like I like the past past 10 or let's say eight years i've worked mainly in english all the documents were yeah. in english mm -hmm. i worked with with different countries where you speak english and like that's 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 how you learn and sometimes i lose the words and that's that's also in coding like sometimes like <laughs> you can't remember <laughs> and you google yeah. it and then you oh, okay yeah, and I would say there's certain there's certain things that are worth remembering, and there's certain things that are worth googling, right? And I think it, it's up to you to depend decide what that is. It depends on what you're trying to do. And, and as Dragonfly points out, I think this is a really good comment um, on this question. It actually depends on personal growth. It helps map your programming brain to logically solve problems in a unique way. But it's good to know. You know you, so he's talking about the algorithms and the data structures piece, and they largely agree with this. I think that there's just it's you know everyone learns differently. As is yeah. you know we all teach. That's the thing. So we I think we're all familiar with like people have different learning styles and and um, and goals, right? And so there's not a one size fits all. Um, I, I'm of the opinion, like I you know, I, I learn a lot. There's a bucket of knowledge I have just for the sake of learning it. Just I read random stuff. Um, like I'm reading a book about breathing right now because that's what I'm into. Um, I don't know why, but then there's, you know, the book, there's, there's a knowledge of stuff that you need to learn uh, just to continue your progression in your career. And, um, but everyone learns differently. Matt learns differently than I do. I, you know, and Andreas learns differently from, from Matt and I, and that's just how it is. So there's, I don't think there's like a one size fits all answer here, but um, just, you know, figure out what you need to learn, I think is like kind of what we're all saying and, and do that, but yeah. Let me grab something I, you said. Oh, go ahead. What, what I don't like here is, and, and Kieran also put that in, like the fear 
gap or fear i would say the fear of gaps and that that has a bit to do with how people hire right now mm -hmm. like yeah they look at the first round is the coding round and if you're bad at coding or if you're if you're not up to the standard of coding then you're out uh, and that I think it's a really bad practice because I agree. Um, it doesn't really it doesn't really show how good an engineer is just by coding. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I, th I think it's stupid to to just here's a, here's a, here's stuff on HackerRank. Go through it and like let's see the outcome and then and then we decide if if we go to the next round. Like, it reminds me when I when I was a kid, I, they'd have you do a lot of these stupid IQ uh, quizzes and tests. And it's like you're really good at solving those types of problems, but that doesn't mean you're going to be an like an effective, intelligent human being. It just means you're good at solving like, you know, these uh, these logic problems and so forth. I, I have like an aversion to these kind of things. I, I totally agree. Um, uh, Manjunath, sorry if I totally mispronounced your name. Can you throw some light on data engineering strategies for uh, enterprises? And yeah, I actually had kind of a, a follow up question or earlier question. Uh, can you give a big picture view of uh, the future of data engineering? So maybe we could try and combine these. So future of data engineering with um, data engineering strategies for enterprises. Go. <laughs> Man. I mean, I, I think from my perspective, the big change happening in enterprises right now is the migration to the cloud. Um, enterprises have been a bit late on this compared to startups, right? Like startups are typically born on AWS or GCP. And once they get into analytics, they're going to adopt Spark or Cloud Data Warehouse or something from the get-go. Like they're, they're never going to be in an on-prem database of any sort. And so that's, there's, there's this big change happening where enterprises now recognize the value of migrating existing data warehouses to the cloud. They're migrating Hadoop clusters. And so to me, that's probably the main theme of the moment. Um, along with that comes a, a move, hopefully, to more agility, right? It's like, OK, we had a very command and control approach to data engineering in the past, where everything lived in one of two systems, and there was a lot of gatekeeping. And now we can be in the cloud where you can attach any number of tools to data sitting on S3 or Google Cloud Storage or something like this. And so how do we like how do we adopt a more flexible mentality to our data engineering pipelines? What orchestration tools do we adopt that can handle this more flexible environment? Yeah, th those are the big questions we get all the time. Like, where, where does our data go? How can we be more flexible? How do we orchestrate in this new environment? I think it, it's also a, a point of like generally of the of the data science realm not just mm -hmm. like in engineering yeah. like companies need a strategy of what to actually do like yeah. what what are they what type of products do they want to build and the the engineering follows then that that strategy but like just doing engineering doing data science doing uh master data management and so on mm -hmm. and data governance just so it's it's there and it's just like we talk with scrum it's because we we want to do it and because like it serves its own purpose that doesn't really make sense and i, th I think that's where, where a lot of companies right now lack is actually figuring out hard like pro projects hard products what do we or concrete products what do we actually want to achieve what which mm -hmm. products do we want to sell how what do we want to achieve and then the cloud as you said matt that's Important, very important. Yeah, and I think to tie it back to his other question here, uh, kind of the big picture on the future of data yeah. engineering as a, as a place of enterprises, I think he's probably asking these um, sort of in a conjoined way. Um, I also think things are just going to be a lot, uh, you know, simpler, like simplification and abstraction is becoming more and more of a theme in data engineering. And so before in the big data days, uh, I, I think it was the rule that you'd be writing a lot of um, uh, kind of manual um, things Right, or you know, pipelines, uh, storage, and so forth, uh, procedures to get data. But a lot of that's being abstracted now. I mean, there's so many companies right now showing up in the data space, which are solving any number of problems in the um, you know in, in the data life cycle. And so I, I think that increasingly, it's figuring out where um, where can you plug and play, and where are you best investing your time to, to create something custom that's going to give you a competitive advantage. I don't think the ability to write I don't think writing custom code ever goes away, but I think it's going to be a lot more focused in a really good way on, on solving key problems. Whereas before there was just a bunch of heavy lifting across the board, um, sort of like in the old days when you use like oxen to uh, like plow fields. Now you have machines to, to do that on farms. And now your, your value of a farmer goes up 
same thing with, with data in general, whether you're a data scientist or data engineering, you're seeing just layers of abstraction across the board right now. And so I think increasingly it's going to be focused on, um, you know, focusing those people and where can we get a competitive advantage? Um, but it's, it, I think to Andreas' point though, it also depends on a, a company being able to recognize that there is a competitive advantage with data. And so that's maybe the first recognition is understanding how are you going to use your data? Um, cause if you can't figure that out, as uh, Andreas points out, like, you know, you, you do MDM and you do all this other stuff and it's kind of like, well, like why are you just checking a bunch of boxes to say that you're data driven or are you doing something with data, which would inherently make you data driven. So. Yeah, no, that's really good. I, I think the product focus is great. That's true. I mean, cloud is a transformation that's happening, but hopefully it's driven by actual very concrete data needs. Like here are things that we want to be able to do in the future. Here are things we want to be able to do more efficiently today. Where our well, and and cloud, cloud at some point too. Cloud at some point, I think, well, yeah, actually, I think the other trend is that at some point, depending on the type of company and depending on your needs, you know, Andreessen Horowitz had that article a few weeks ago about how yeah. cloud is actually detrimental from a cost perspective at a certain point where they think that, you know, companies are leaving hundreds of billions of dollars on the table because they're going too cloud heavy actually and not putting certain stuff back on prem. Um, so I think it's more just, you know, where are you, where are you gonna get the biggest wins and where's it gonna be cost effective, whether it's on prem or cloud. I think you're right, cloud is good, when you're, especially when you're starting out, you'd be like, it's, it'd be idiotic these days unless there's a good reason to buy server rooms, all the stuff you'd do back in the 90s and 2000s and before. Um, just more flexibility at a certain point. Say you're, you're lucky enough to be to get wins with data to the point where you're able to be a um, you know a Dropbox or a Netflix or a you know uh, or whoever Facebook then it's like um, it might be more cost effective for you to to figure out some other ways besides cloud to do that or maybe stick with the cloud if they want to give you a good enough deal but the point is you have a lot of options these days it's not like you there's a one size fits all so it's also the the independence that yeah. when you're in an enterprise and that's specifically for enterprises, enterprises, they have their IT departments, they have their processes that are fixed. And if you need a firewall opening, you, then you need to like go jump through hoops and then three weeks later you get it. And if you're, if you're starting on the cloud, then yeah. your engineering team is going to be in charge of this stuff. And then it's, it's actually going very, very fast. Mm -hmm. That's also something that important yeah um what you saying oh just like a more basically a more fragmented approach where there's more individual team responsibility you have a set of best practices you have monitoring of what teams are doing but within that context they have flexibility to do the things they need to do yeah. it's like self-serve approach yeah yeah well cool um i don't see any of the audience questions here any anything else in you guys' mind today <laughs> <laughs> don't use don't use the difference between list sets and dictionaries performance in in job interviews please <laughs> <laughs> so interviews are very controversial right i mean i think this controversy has been raging for at least five years about how we should be interviewing people we, we could rant on that for a while <laughs> I think it'd be good to at least kind of know the difference between these, but yeah, and I think, you know, I wrote back to Ku, I think these are, these are good questions. I think it depends on the context of the interview. Mm -hmm. um, like when I do Python interviews, I think it's it's a question, you know, these are some of the questions that do pop up just to make sure, you know, and, and especially in Python, like what's the difference between like a, a tuple, for example, and a, and a list, but um, uh, I don't go too much into like, okay, so tell me the difference between like a link list and a queue, for example, like, a, like you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it doesn't really apply um, to what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, what would be good interview questions? Hmm. If, you were to, if you were to interview, if, if all of us were to, it's, I guess, we're a kind of a Mexican standoff, if we were to interview each other right now, what would be the questions we'd ask each other? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but generally, I, I, um, I would go the other route, I, like, for me, the very important is: um, Do you have a track record? Do you, can mm -hmm. you can you show something? Can you show something on GitHub or wh wherever? Yeah. Because this will lead you actually into conversation. This will lead you actually into something where you can find out more uh, toward, uh, uh, beyond the standard questions like how does somebody think? How does how does like what's the thought process behind this? Mm -hmm. uh, does does this person know what 
what they've done there or is that just copy pasted from somewhere and i think that's like having some concrete stuff that you can talk about and like to, to get the thinking that's the most important stuff the coding if there's missing like if if a person doesn't know the the performance difference between a list sets and dictionaries in my opinion who cares like I, I mean, I would say that yeah. that's something I'd like to be to see taught within teams. In other words, when people review each other's code, they can point out opportunities for significant performance improvements in, in the code, which is what I would always do in terms of teaching Python. I, we wouldn't have seminars or something. It was just like I would I would review someone's pull request and say, OK, this is not a great way to do this particular thing that you're doing. Like there's it's more natural to use a dictionary in the setting in Python. But yeah, I agree like that. I don't. I, what? I, one thing ahead, we used Joe. to do is that one thing we used to do is actually give people a broken project and then have them um, go through and fix okay. it. So okay. they they, they would get pull um, like a this is like a software engineering interview when I used to write software, but it was a like a Django project and there were a bunch of errors in it. You have to go back through and um, and fix it. Mm -hmm. and if you can fix it, then then you can ask the person about how did you fix it? What was your thought? How did you actually go at fixing this problem and then you understand how does the thought process behind it work and so on right mm -hmm. and so it's basically the same approach yeah mark healing has a good point here instead of asking a uh, standard question i would give a big picture business problem and see how they attempt to solve it I, I like this too um yeah it's sort of the old thing like and i, I like these, these approaches like figure out okay so like what have you solved how do you solve it? and dig, dig deep into that too so you're, you're asking okay so like how did you think about this problem as you solved it? It's really easy to kind of BS your way through interviews, I think, especially with these uh, kind of superficial questions. Like, you know, tell me the difference between a, uh, a dictionary and a, and a set, for example, right? Like that's, those are Googleable. So I try and say, I think maybe stay away from Googleable things. Uh, Cause that's something that anyone can, can figure out through like a question dump, for example. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. There's also the kind of base camp approach, right? Which to be fair, Basecamp has been in a bit of turmoil lately for internal political reasons. That a few, yeah. But, but at the same time, I mean, the, the founders of the company really advocate for this idea that they don't really do interviews. They just have contractors. In other words, if they like you and they think you, they want to hire you, then they say, okay, come in as a contractor. Here's a project. Go complete it in this time frame. Bring it back. We'll pay you. If we like your work, then we'll probably hire you from there. And I, yeah, I like what Susan said is here as well. Like is, dirty data is a great way to start with data engineering. Uh, unfortunately, data engineers still have to spend a lot of time doing things like figuring out how to parse bad files and such. It, it comes up all the time. And I'm like, really? This is this is so much my job still. The dirty data comes comes from uh, automatically. And that dirty data comes from automatically. So you, you, from everywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good point, Susan. Yeah, she's she's the queen of a dirty data shout out to Susan Walsh. Um, if you need a, your data cleaned, uh, hit her up. <laughs> so yeah. awesome. Go, Susan. Cool. Well, I think we're coming up on time here. I know you got a barbecue to get to, Andreas. So. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks for joining the show, man. We'll have to have you back yeah, on. Uh, and yeah, love talking to you. So right. if you want to come back yeah. on, love to have Anytime you back Anytime I'm on. like, I think it's really cool talking to, to other data engineers who are like, in the topics so. yeah likewise cool. awesome thanks for having me cool all right well thanks to the audience out there uh we'll be back next monday um with um more topics and uh another live show so anyway thanks for all the questions and the comments here and we'll, we'll see you next monday so all right thanks all Bye -bye. take care <laughs>